In the next 20 minutes, you're going to learn everything you need to know as a beginner in AI. If you're a student looking for a career change or just want to level up your skills, this video will help you develop a strong intuition for how AI makes predictions and solves real-world problems. We'll discuss fundamental AI concepts to show how you can train a computer to do things like predict real estate values, diagnose cancer, identify cats, and detect fraud. It's a lot to cover, so let's jump right in. How much do you think your house is worth? Well, if you go on Zillow, you'll find that some houses have Zestimates. Zillow doesn't have a human combing through every listing trying to figure out how much it's worth. It's done by AI. So how might an AI like this work? Let's take a simple example where the model is provided just one piece of data, the square footage of the house. Its goal is to predict the price of the house. To train this model, we need to provide real life examples of houses that have sold. Each example is labeled so the model knows the square footage of each house and how much it's sold for. Now we want to be able to ask it, if a house is 2000 square feet, what should the price be? To do this, we need to fit a line through our data like this. This line will help us predict the price at any given square footage. In this case, our price is $2 million for a 2000 square foot house. But reality isn't that simple. Obviously, there isn't a one-to-one -one relationship between square footage and price. Also, this line is a pretty bad predictor of actual prices. Just look how far off it is in some cases. So how should we actually draw the line? It could look like this, or this, or even this. Notice how for each line that we draw, there will always be some gap between our predicted values and the actual values. Our goal is to find the best equation to draw the best line that minimizes these gaps. The smaller these gaps, the more accurate our predictions. And to do this, we need to use something called a cost function. We're going to use a cost function called the mean squared error function. If you're not a math whiz, it looks a little scary, but it's actually quite simple. This term is the actual value of y. This term is our predicted value of y. So this minus this is the gap between our guess and the real value. This means we want to add up all these gaps. But wait, if our predicted value is smaller than the actual value, then this will give us a positive number. But if it's larger than the actual value, then it gives us a negative number. Adding up all these positives and all these negatives might cancel each other out. And that's not what we want. We don't really care if we overshot or undershot. We just want to know how far off were we for each guess. So we square this entire thing, which makes everything a positive value. Okay, so now we can sum up all the gaps. But there's one more thing. If we just leave it like this, then the error will get larger and larger the more training examples we have, because we'd be summing up more gaps. That's kind of silly, because we don't want to say our model is less accurate just because we have more training examples. More training examples is usually a good thing. So we divide this entire thing by the number of training examples, which gives us the average of all our gaps squared. In other words, we have our mean squared error. This value is often referred to as our cost, hence the term cost function. So now we understand cost functions. But remember, our goal is to minimize our cost. This line will obviously produce a larger cost than this one. In other words, it's a far less accurate model. But how do we draw the line that minimizes our average cost? That's where our optimization algorithm comes in. One of the most common optimization algorithms is called gradient descent. It involves a bit of calculus, but the idea is pretty simple. Remember, our goal is to find the equation that most accurately predicts an output when we give it an input. For our simple example, we only have two variables to play with. Let's call them W and B. These variables are often referred to as weights and biases. By adjusting these parameters, we can change the shape of our line and hopefully get it to be as accurate as possible. For now, let's just say B equals zero and ignore it. In this case, every value for W would give us a different line and each line gives us a different cost. We wanna find the value of W that gives us the lowest cost. The way gradient descent works is like this. It starts with some random value for w, checks the corresponding cost value, then changes the value of w, and repeats this process until it finds the w with the smallest cost value. The algorithm for gradient descent looks like this, which again looks kind of scary, 
but is actually pretty simple. Remember our cost function? It's a quadratic function. So on a graph, it looks something like this. Just looking at this graph, it's pretty obvious that the value for W which produces the smallest cost value is this value right here. But how do we know what that value is? To find it, we need to use some basic calculus. This term is what we call a derivative term. A way to think of this derivative term is, what is the slope of a line that crosses only this point? For those who aren't math whizzes, just know that a negative slope looks like this, a positive slope looks like this, and a zero slope looks flat like this. So the slope at this point, where w equals 10, might be something like positive 2. Now let's go back to our equation. We want w to be w minus some learning rate multiplied by 2. The learning rate is always positive, so let's say it's 1 for now. In this case, w now equals w minus 2. So it moves down the graph like this. Then we repeat this process until we hit a point where the slope is 0. And we know that this point is where the value of w produces the lowest cost. So let's go back to this alpha variable. You'll recall that this is the learning rate, but what's the point of this parameter? You should think of this parameter as the size of the steps we're taking for each iteration of gradient descent. If your learning rate is too low, you'll need to take a lot of steps to get to the minimum. In practice, this means that it'll take a very long time to train your model, and it can also be more expensive. But if your learning rate is too large, you might actually jump over the minimum. This means that your model might end up being less accurate. So now you know how label data, cost functions, and gradient descent helps us build a model that can predict house prices given some input, like square footage. But isn't our example too simple? Obviously, Zillow doesn't just use one feature to predict house prices. It's common for AI models to take in hundreds or thousands of features to make predictions. Well, it turns out, if we add more features, the concepts we learn are basically the same. The math is just slightly different. Instead of a model that looks like this, with one weight and one feature, you get a model that looks like this, where x1 is the first feature, x2 is the second feature, and so on, and w1 is the weight for the first feature, and w2 is the weight for the second feature, and so on. You can simplify this by saying x is equal to a vector containing all these features, and w is equal to a vector containing all the weights for each feature. Our model might look the same, but remember we're dealing with vectors instead of individual numbers now. Our cost function works the same way. It still gives us the mean squared error between our predicted values and the actual values. The only difference is we're using more variables to predict these values. But gradient descent will have to be modified slightly. In our previous example, each step of gradient descent only updated one weight for one feature, the weight for square footage. With multiple features, each step of gradient descent updates every weight for every feature at the same time. Unfortunately, this can't be visualized because we can't draw a 100 dimensional graph, but the goal is to end up with the optimal weights for each feature that minimizes our cost function. One final thing I'll add is that the line doesn't have to be straight. In fact, it rarely is. You can add polynomial terms by raising the x's to different powers. This allows us to have curvy lines which can help us make better predictions. We've learned how AI can predict numerical values like house prices. This is called linear regression. Other forms of linear regression include weather forecasts and stock price predictions. But what about AI that can predict whether an email is spam or if a tumor is cancerous? When we're predicting house prices, the predicted value can be any positive number. It could range from less than $1 to more than a billion dollars. But if we want AI to predict cancer given some information about a tumor, that prediction is simply yes or no. This type of problem is called a classification problem. Like regression, classification is one of the most common types of problems in machine learning. In the case of cancer prediction, a yes or no prediction can be represented as 0 or 1. This is what we want the model to output. But if we feed a linear regression model a bunch of data like length, width, and height of a tumor, it might output a number like this instead. So how do we get an output of 0 or 1? To do this, we're going to use a model called logistic regression. Logistic regression uses a function called the sigmoid function. 
to compress any input into a value between 0 and 1. Let's dissect the sigmoid function. E stands for Euler's number, which is a constant that's equal to about 2.7. And Z is going to be the predicted value from our model before we put it in a sigmoid function. The sigmoid function works like this. When Z is a large positive number, the output will be close to 1. When Z is a large negative number, the output will be close to 0. If you don't believe me, just plug in the values 5 and negative 5 for Z. So when our model gives us a value, if we plug that value into a sigmoid function, we get a number between 0 and 1. I want you to think of this value as the probability of each class, yes or no. If our model takes a bunch of data for a training example and spits out the number 0.9, it's saying that there's a 90% chance that the tumor is cancerous. But remember, our goal is to make a final yes or no decision. So is 90% enough for us to say that our patient has cancer? Maybe we want to be super safe and have our patient do additional testing, even if it's just a 30% chance. Or maybe we want to be super conservative because we don't want to scare patients unnecessarily. So we'll only output yes if the model is 99% sure. This is called our decision boundary, and it's something we need to define for our model in order for it to solve these classification problems. Training a classification model is just like training a regression model. We use a cost function to measure the gaps between our guesses and the actual values, and we use gradient descent to optimize our weights and minimize those gaps. It turns out the mean squared error function doesn't work for logistic regression, so we'll need to use a different cost function called the logistic loss function. It looks like this, and we won't go into all the math here, but just know that it accomplishes the same task of measuring the average gap between our model's guesses and the actual answers. Gradient descent works the same way. In fact, the formula is exactly the same. The only difference is that in linear regression, we take the derivative of the mean squared error function, but in logistic regression, we take the derivative of the logistic loss function. When we did linear regression, our goal was to draw a line that has the lowest average error between the values predicted by the line and the actual values in our training examples. With logistic regression, our goal is to draw a line that most accurately separates our classes, the yeses and noes. Just like linear regression, the cost function and gradient descent help us adjust this line to become as accurate as possible. And hopefully, at the end, we have a function or a line that can accurately predict the correct class for a new piece of data that's not in our training set. We've learned about linear and logistic regression. These are two basic AI models that are great for explaining how AI works to beginners. But these models have some weaknesses in real life applications. In this video, our training examples only included a couple of features. Linear and logistic regression models can actually handle hundreds or even thousands of features. But what if we gave our model this 1000 by 1000 pixel image and asked it to predict whether or not this is a cat? For image classification, each pixel is a feature, which means that our model will need to take in a million features per image. Linear and logistic regression are usually not the most efficient models to handle tasks at this scale. We're now going to discuss the machine learning architecture that's responsible for almost every major AI breakthrough in the past 10 years. Deep learning. While we might look at this image and see that it's obviously a cat, a computer actually sees 1 million numerical values, one for each pixel. To determine whether an image is a cat or not, it needs to understand the patterns that make a cat a cat. How might a human tackle this problem of identifying a cat? Well, we know that cats have whiskers, they're furry, they have pointy ears, and so on. A machine might tackle this problem as a set of logistic regression problems. It looks at an image and asks, are there whiskers? Is there fur? Are there pointy ears? And it might also assign levels of importance to each feature. For example, it might assign a greater weight to whiskers than fur, because all cats have whiskers, but not every cat has fur. Finally, it might conclude that based on the values of all these features, yes, this is a cat. In deep learning, we use something called neural networks. A neural network contains layers and layers of interconnected neurons. The first layer of our neural network is called our input layer. These are just the raw values of all our pixels. 
The second layer contains three neurons. You can think of each neuron as its own logistic regression model. Each of these neurons represents something that gives us more information about whether or not this is a cat. For example, this neuron might represent, are there whiskers? This one could represent, is there fur? And this one could represent, are there pointy ears? Finally, this output layer represents our final answer. Is it a cat or not? In this case, because the model thinks there's a high chance that it sees whiskers, fur, and pointy ears, it believes that there's a high probability that this image is a cat. But how does it know what whiskers look like? How did these numbers get calculated? It turns out each of these neurons could also be broken down into multiple logistic regression problems. Let's add another layer to our model. This neuron might represent the question, are there grey lines? Maybe this one represents, are there similar coloured lines close to each other? And this one might represent, are there clusters of the same colour? The answers to these questions might give our model some indication of whether there's whiskers or fur. You can see how this problem of image classification can actually be broken down into layers and layers of logistic regression problems. That's the basic intuition behind deep learning. But here's the crazy thing. Nobody knows what features these neurons and layers actually represent. Neural networks are basically a big black box. We understand the math behind how it works, but we can never really say this neuron represents X. What we found is that adding more layers and neurons often improves the accuracy of models. This is why AI companies are constantly building bigger models and racing to buy GPUs to power them. The mathematical concepts behind deep learning can be traced all the way back to the 1940s. But only around the 2010s did we have the data and the computing power to make these models useful for real life tasks. Since then, deep learning has been a part of almost every major AI product release, from ChatGPT to Face ID to spam filters. But there's one more, perhaps underappreciated type of machine learning that I want to introduce. In this video, every model we've seen requires us to provide labeled training data. We show the model what a correct answer looks like and hope that if we do this enough times, it'll start producing correct answers on its own. This is called supervised learning. But there's another type of machine learning called unsupervised learning, which doesn't require any labeled data. Have you ever gotten a fraud alert from your bank? How did it know that this transaction was unusual for you? For example, Maybe you're in a foreign country, or maybe you just ordered something that you never usually buy. Your bank can't possibly list every purchase that could be considered unusual for every person. Instead, it uses unsupervised learning models to spot outliers. Unsupervised learning models can also group data points together to find hidden patterns that we weren't even trying to find. For example, we can use a clustering algorithm to divide our data into groups that share similarities. We don't necessarily know what these similarities are, we just know that our model is telling us that the transactions in each cluster are similar in some way. But here's the interesting thing. A human can take a sample from each cluster and after some analysis might realize that all these transactions were stuff you bought for yourself. This is stuff you bought for your wife, and this is stuff you bought for your kids. Nobody labeled these transactions, so the model can't know who each purchase was for. It simply found similarities and grouped transactions together. For example, maybe purchases for your wife are expensive. Don't happen often, but seem to happen around the same time each year. Whereas purchases for your kids are cheaper, but happen consistently throughout the year. We never told the model to label these groups, it just found the hidden patterns on its own. And that's the power of unsupervised learning. So there you have it. In this video, you learn that AI isn't magic. It's just math. By using cost functions and optimization algorithms, we can minimize the average gap between the correct answers and our predictions. With enough training examples, hopefully our AI will be able to predict the right answer even when we give it inputs that were not in our training set. We did a deep dive on fundamental concepts like regression, classification, deep learning, and unsupervised learning. Now you know more about AI than probably about 99% of people in Silicon Valley. If this subject was interesting to you, I hope you'll consider a career in AI and continue your learning journey. And if you enjoyed this video, like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. 